ITV Player brings you ITV4, amazing telly you can't miss. <laughs> I've never seen so much blood in my life. Darrington had a reputation as a very violent prison. Hey, you boy, I'm coming for you. Just a sense of alarm. You don't belong here. Get out, get out. This is a true story. Within the next two minutes, pull it. All hell's gonna break loose. I thought they were gonna kick. Just keep running. It's a dramatized account based on the escapee's own recollections in letters and meetings. Anytime anybody's willing to break out of a penitentiary, I know one thing. They're desperate. Our biggest fear is that he's armed. Give me right now! This is what freedom is all about. Dennis Wayne Hall. I love country music, fast cars, beautiful women. Most of all, I love excitement. I guess that's the way it all starts. When you're standing there waiting to pull a gun, it's just like someone's dumping a truckload of adrenaline through your veins. There's no turning back. How you doing? This is it. Give me all your money now! Unfortunately, many of the things that release the greatest adrenaline are often risky and illegal. In all the armed robberies I did, I didn't hurt anybody. But I got an 80-year prison sentence. I was put on a chain bus heading for the Darrington unit south of Houston. I was 22 years old. Hey, young fella, you ever been to this place you're going? No. On that bus are people who have already been on the unit. There's been many a stabbing, many a beating. Never turn your back on an inmate or a guard. And those are the things that are going through my mind of, uh, how, how am I going to react to this? The reality of exactly where I'm at sets in when the bus pulls up to the back gate. Fresh meat! I got first bids on that one. Fresh meat! Fresh meat! Fresh meat! And it's just a variety of slurs that you hear come out. I'm gonna make all you mine! Oh, yeah! My worst fear was being late because of my young, innocent look. Hey, quit, boy. Hey, hey, newie, hey, new boy. I'm thinking I'm gonna do whatever it takes to defend myself. If I had an encounter with someone that I didn't think I could beat up with my hand, I'd stab him with a pencil. And at least I'd send a message. I wasn't looking to be nobody's bitch. <laughs> early 90s, I was a criminal investigator at the uh, Darrington unit. Darrington had a reputation as a very violent prison. It had a offender population of approximately 2,000. Okay. The majority of them doing long sentences. Let's go! Murderers, armed robbers, violent offenders. There was no place worse they could send you. At first, I mean, I surveyed the scene. I looked around to just to get an idea of how far things were. And I realized, you know, the fields are wide open not just going to take off running and get to a tree line before you get a bullet in the back of your head. I 
got a job in the prison kitchen. That's where I met Harry. Hey, you're new here, aren't you? Yeah, Dennis Hope. Harry Decker. I got along good with Harry. How do you like it so far? As long as he felt you're not one of these BSers, he was solid. I can't stand it. In prison, a lot of people are there going to talk about escape. But the truth of the matter is, they settle into a comfort zone. And something dramatic has to remove them from that comfort zone. For me, it was the riot. I'm fearful for my life. My biggest fear is that someone's going to stab me. I'm going to end up dead. I've never seen so much blood in my life. I had already known about inmates with AIDS. Head on the ground. Once they laid me down in that blood, it was another fear of that's how I'm gonna die. When I saw that it was just that easy to happen, I thought, if you're gonna kill me, I'll give you a shot at me going over the fence. Harry. Yeah. I'm telling you, man, if we don't get out of here, they're gonna kill us. Well, if you're going, I'm going too. I need it, Harry. So picture this is the first fence. And that's gonna be the second fence. I told him we could cut the first fence and go over the second one. He said, well, why don't we just cut through both of them? I told him, do you want to sit in between the middle of the fence and cut it? You're sitting up. You're fair game inside that fence. So we're gonna have to take the fastest road possible for the second fence, which means going straight over. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna wrap blankets around our legs, and that's gonna protect us from the razor wire. If we flipped over the top so our body weight pulled us off the barbs, I figured we'd be okay. Kind of like they're doing a handstand, right? We're worried that if one of us got cut going over that razor wire and it was fatal or it was to the point you couldn't stop the bleeding, what were we gonna do? And then there was the biggest fear of what happens if they open fire before we even get on the second fence. The guard towers are staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They make no secret of the fact that if an inmate attempts to escape, they are going to shoot to stop that person. Man, that's a 223 bullet, and it's going to kill you. It's going to rip through you when it hits you. This is a dramatized account of a prison break based on the recollections of escapee Dennis Hope. Hope is planning his escape route from the Darrington unit in Texas. So what did I miss? Well, there was a prison break over there at the prison, eh? You're kidding. Three guys got out, but uh, they secured the prisoner pretty easy. Oh, man. Once I decided to break out, I began to see how the unit would respond. Any big uh, directions from the big guy? I believe that in order to beat my enemy, I had to know my enemy. How long did it take? About a half an hour. I learned that it's a five mile perimeter and that perimeter is set up as quickly as possible. The real nightmare begins if the prisoner gets outside of that uh, initial perimeter. Inside that perimeter, you're able to contain them. Outside that perimeter, you have no control. There's only one way to do this, OK? Once I learned that they put a five-mile perimeter out, that was etched in stone in my head. We got to get over these fences and run five miles. 
less than 30 minutes. Five miles. Five miles, that's the goal. Which means we gotta get in shape. Run in shape. Beat five miles and get there as fast as you can. There were no other options than to run, you know, on foot. And in high school, I ran cross country. And then in prison, running was an outlet for me to free my mind. I can picture myself running down the beach just thinking of freedom, you know, oceans, sun, waves, crashing. Mentally, I'm somewhere else. That would just enable me to just keep running nonstop. But Harry never liked running too much. To get through the fence, we were gonna need the help of an old guy I knew who worked in the maintenance department. What can I do for you? I need some wire cutters. You know, in the penitentiary, if you ask somebody for some wire cutters, it's understood what you want them for. You're not clipping your toenails with them, that's for sure. Just me. Extra food, whenever you want. I control the pantry. Okay. We discussed on several occasions of uh, when we were gonna pass these cutters. And then one day he told me, he said, uh, I got them. It'll be under your tray. Just make sure it's clear. And when you say it's cool, I'm handing it to you. Stuck my tray into the slot. He stuck the cutters under the tray so that when I pulled my hand straight back out, it went right into my pants. I'm shaking worse than when I was doing a robbery. If I walk out of this chow hall and one of these officers stop me with this, it's over. I mean, it had my palms sweat. I hid the cutters in a box of meat in the freezer. I got to thinking, look, bolt cutters have big handles on them. I can just get some leverage. And I come up with an idea of cutting a couple pieces of copper tubing and slipping them over like cheater bars. Everything was right on schedule. But getting through the fence was no good if we didn't know where to run to once we were out. Then one day, I saw a church brochure laying on the floor. to the back of it, I saw the map of the area. And then I thought to myself, you gotta be kidding me. You're not serious. Somebody is sending me a message. They don't want me here. I knew that if I put together what I had gathered with what the map showed, I was no longer running blind. Within half an hour of busting out, follow the pylons, get across Highway 288, five mile search perimeter, then head northeast towards Houston. It was rock solid then, it's, it's gonna happen. Barbed wire is razor sharp. You get caught up on there, man. You can bleed to death. 
going over the fences was the most dangerous option of all of them. Because it was the most dangerous, we looked for ways to reduce the danger. And that's where taking the lights out came in. And so I got to thinking, where's the lights at? Where's the generator that runs the lights? Can one switch take out the lights? Harry and I, the generator was in the boiler room. Hey, Johnny, how are you doing? There was a guy who had just got fired from the boiler room, and he started giving me the information. Are all the lights for the prison going from the boiler room? Yeah. He said the boiler room powered the entire prison, and the backup generator was in the same place. It was music to my ears. From the boiler room, we could take out every light in the prison but we didn't know how to get inside. There was a security fence, and there's no way the guys working the generators would help us out. The boiler room at Darrington was manned by some of the most trusted offenders, and most of them take a lot of pride in their jobs. Then one day, an inmate called Jason Montgomery walked up to me. Hey, dude, I'll talk to you for a second. for life. It's, you know, I want out, man. I heard you have a plan. I didn't know nothing about the guy. But I decided to let Jason in on my plan because I was afraid that if I didn't, he would go tell. He would snitch it off. Okay, you're in. As luck would have it, Jason brought a whole new dimension to the escape. I know the guy in the boiler room. Jason had been down in the boiler room and knew those guys there. You serious? Can you get us in? From that point on, the lights are going to go out. Harry and Jason were nonchalant about five miles. They didn't think it was anything. But I wasn't going to underestimate it. It motivated me to train as hard as I possibly could because the reward was going to be well worth it. I always thought about girls I played, you know, mental game, and I was thinking, just do five more. That, that, that sexy chick goes home with you. If you don't, <laughs> you're going home alone. <laughs> when I realized I could run 10 miles easily, <sighs> I knew I was ready. I had just arrived at the Darrington unit in November of 1994. By the time Thanksgiving rolled around, I'd been there about two and a half weeks. The problem with the guard up top there, that's, that's when it was all right. I was told he was going to be down this morning. I was just, just getting my feet on the ground, figuring out the facility and the staff. I told Harry and Jason we were busting out on the Saturday night of Thanksgiving weekend. So that means top dogs, they're gone. Everyone's at home with their wives. It's the best shot. Are you with me? I'm with you, man. You sure? Yeah, I told you, man. I'm with you. On the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, I left the facility and drove, picked up my children, and went to my mother's house in Colleen, Texas, which is about four hours from Darrington. So, are you there yet? No, not yet, but not too long. That Friday night, I'm tense, you know. My stomach's tight. My future, my life, all comes down to 24 hours. And whether or not I do everything according to plan. Deep down inside, you are thinking, what if you blow the back of my head out going over this fence? And then you try not to think about that. Just think positive. It's going to work.
Prisoner Dennis Hope is about to try to break out of the Darrington unit in Texas. Shortly before the count, I put the wire cutters in my shoes. I had my blanket. And I brought my coat. As they opened the door to let us go out for chow, I thought to myself, I won't be coming back to this. And as I walked down the run and then went down the stairs, that's when I met Jason. You ready for this? Let's do it. As we're walking down the hallway, I was behind him because I had the cover. And if they stopped him for any reason, I'm turning around, going back the other way. It's like you're carrying a truckload of dynamite, and you're looking at everything ahead of you to make sure they don't say, hey, you. Come here. In my mind, I'm thinking, there's no way you're going to stop me now. Harry was waiting to see if we were going to show up. He was going to meet us in the boiler room in five minutes. Jason's job description was to take the boiler room clerk and subdue him. It's Jason. And after five, six minutes, he hasn't done anything. Count time's at 9.30, the clock's ticking, and the longer he waits, the more chances of an officer catching us. And that's when I decide I'm not waiting no more. I gotta go see what's going on. And as I peek open the door and I see Jason sitting there talking. This stupid idiot. Mind if I talk to him for a second? Go ahead. Man, what are you doing? You know, you mean I can take the dude out or what? Man, we're on the timeline. That's when he says, Can we do this tomorrow, man? My first thought was, you got to be kidding me. Man, you're not going to screw this up for me. You don't want to do it, I'll do it. Are you in? Are you sure? Shut up! Just put him in a choco and brought him down to the ground. Get on it! Back up! And I just told him, said, look, man, you stood up, I'll kill you. That's when I told Jason, start cutting your blanket. And then the buzzer for the gate goes on. And my heart just stopped. Well, I grabbed the screwdriver and I walked over to the door. Who is it? Me, man. It's Harry. Once I saw it was Harry, I was just like, oh, good. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, Harry, let's go. We cut our blanket in half so we can wrap it around our waist and took a screwdriver and stuck it through it. We used two strings to tie it around like chaps. We were ready to leave. I started loosening the fuel lines to the backup generator. Inside of me, I just felt as if it was the last act before it all goes down. Within the next few minutes, this generator's useless. All hell's gonna break loose, and they're not gonna have no way to get this power back on. Which one is it? You sure? Like you're gonna pull it, right? Pull it! And at that moment, if there was ever any fun of turning back, that was erased. It got deadly quiet as the sounds of the engines that operate the boiler room wound down. Okay, let's go. 
ran out. You could hear people hollering. Hey, hey. Perfect, perfect. If I have to climb on this fence, it's gonna cover the noise. I ran to his spot. And I began to cut along the bottom of the fence. Anxiety is built up inside you, pushing yourself, saying, come on, come on, come on. I was the first one in between the two fences. And I'm thinking to myself, at any minute, I'm a dead man. We move to the second fence. Okay. Get ready. And suddenly, Jason says, Get the pliers. What? Get the pliers. Let's go through the wire. No, no, we're going over. There's a pop wire up there. Let's go over that. We don't have time to cut through the fence. You know that. A person could get over that fence in less than nine seconds. It would take me more than nine seconds to cut that fence. You want the wire cutters? These wire cutters? You sure? So I threw the pliers over the fence. That changed his mind real quick. The razor wire hooked my coat, but my weight pulled me off the fence. As soon as I hit the ground, I'm outside of that mental fence. I'm outside of that physical fence. It's wide open spaces from here on out. When I turned around, I saw Harry stuck on the fence. I thought, damn it, he didn't listen to me. They're gonna kill him if he stays up there. Plus, if they see him up there, they'll know someone did escape. I gotta go back. I reached up and I jerked him as hard as I could to get him untangled. You good? Yeah. As I turned to look to see if he'd gotten up, that's when I seen him kind of hobbling. So I knew. He wasn't gonna keep up with me. As I took off running, I heard a loud voice holler, halt! And then came rapid shot. And I thought, they're gonna kill you. When the shots rang out, all of the time that I had banked on before they knew that there had been an escape had evaporated just like that. And that's when I thought I got to go as fast as you can, as far as you can, as long as you can. Just keep running. Very good. I was sitting at uh, the kitchen table in my mother's home playing a board game with my children. <laughs> when the phone rang, hello, and it was Major Johnny Thomas, and the first word out of his mouth was, we've had an escape. How many? When? Like any other prison warden, I immediately felt absolutely sick to my stomach. Oh, I'm coming now. I have to go. I'm sorry, guys. When I arrived at the facility, it was utter chaos. I'm very apprehensive, very frustrated. You don't know who's gone. All you know is that some shots were fired, there was some sabotage, and that you're doing the best that you can. Anytime anybody's willing to break out of a penitentiary, I know one thing, they're desperate and willing to do anything. So I had a major concern for the public safety at that point. Once the alarm is raised, we're going to lock down the prison, start conducting a detailed count to find out who exactly is gone. 
then start putting people on the perimeter. We're going to contact the local police so they can respond. I heard the sound of a van. And I thought, son of a bitch, they're chasing me. I thought, as long as it's one, I can get past him. I just ran as hard as I could. You can do it. You can do it. silent clock constantly ticking and that ticking represents just how close they're moving in on you. I knew that if I could get to 288 within the next 30 minutes that I could get across that road but the longer I wait the more cars are going to be there. Inside my head that clock kept saying go 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 go. The terrain from this point on was unfamiliar to me. Then I saw the pylons, which I knew ran parallel to Highway 288. I knew I was headed in the right direction. Major. Warden? So, what's the scoop? When I first got there, I was told that the tracking dogs had run a strong scent up to a large copse of woods right outside the unit. We picked up a couple of scents back there. There was two trails, but this was the strongest scent. The belief was that all three of them were in that woods and that that woods were contained. You said there were there were a couple scents though, right? What about the other one? No one's checking it out. Look, everything's under control, Warden. He said there's no way anybody could have run that quickly and gotten that far ahead of us, so it had to be ghosts. Well, maybe we should check it. I'd like to be taken out to 288, please. As I approach 288, this is the last part of the puzzle. It has to be done right. Don't let them catch you. Don't do nothing foolish. 288 represents the finish line. They're not going to be looking outside of it. I've seen the officers in the cars. There's no doubt in my mind they would put a bullet in my head if they caught me. To me, it was as if it was sharks circling a sinking boat just waiting for you to hit the water. And I didn't want to be in that water with those sharks. Search parties are hunting for escaped prisoner Dennis Hope and two other inmates. Crossing 288, in my mind, was like the last part of the chess game. All the pieces are in position. It's at that point that I size up the cars to make sure I'm not misidentifying one of them. I waited for a gap. Then I hurried across on all fours. So if somebody saw me, I would look like a dog running across the road. Once I get across the road, in my mind, it's checkmate. I've won the game. The hardest part's over. You know, the best things are yet to come. When we got there, I said, there's a crow flies. How far are we from Darrington? Three miles or so. And that's when I felt sick again. How much of a jogging man are you, Major? 
No, not really. And I told him, well, I am, and I could easily have covered that distance in about 24, 25 minutes. Well, at that point, I felt certain that our initial perimeter had been beaten. I felt that uh, the odds had drastically went up. Now's the golden opportunity to put some distance between us. A convict on the run could just disappear in the woods near the Darrington prison unit, so guards launched a systematic search cutting through the thick underbrush. We probably had upwards of 180, 250 people looking for these guys. They got about two-thirds of the way through when one of them actually hit something on the ground they felt like was a man. When they investigated, they had actually caught Montgomery. We caught Decker in the uh, housing area the second night of the chase. But frustrated guards still can't find the third escapee. At this point, I realized that Dennis Wayne Holt was a pretty smart guy. He had beat us and was gone. The ground search is the responsibility of the warden. As soon as that perimeter is taken down, it, it becomes my sole responsibility to capture him. This is Dennis Hope. Well, this guy is fit and he's smart. He outran the guards. I want you to find out everything you can about this guy, what his girlfriend looked like, what kind of car he drives. We anticipated that Hope would return to the Dallas area because that's where his friends and family were located. I needed money, and I knew that the fastest way to get it would be a place that I had robbed before. It's just a matter of time now. Dallas, Texas, here I come. Excuse me, sir. Do you mind giving me a lift? The majority of these individuals are sociopaths. Okay, listen, I'm gonna need your car, old man. Okay, you just keep driving, you do exactly... No, you do exactly what I say. You know, they'll hurt anybody that gets in their way. Pull over here. When I got $30 from the old man's wallet, I knew that was enough to buy a gun. But I'd seen some BB guns that looked real, and that's why I decided that I'll go get one of those. I pulled up at a grocery store I'd robbed before prison. At the time of day, they always used to count their cash. I walked in, and sure enough, I could see the safe was wide open. When I stood there waiting for the other two people to move out of the way, that's when all that adrenaline is just dumping through. You know, it's just like time's moving in slow motion. I said, do you know what time it is? She, she looked at her watch. And I said, well, I'll tell you. You fill up this bag now. And the guy. Give it to him. He knows the routine. Move! Let's go. He puts the money in the sack. And as he hands it to me, I'm thinking, that's all I need. point I get everything that I need I'm scot free give me all your money now give it to me move for the next few weeks I was robbing stores in Dallas is that it? using the money in Memphis to party to gamble pay good looking women catch up for a lost time give me your money now at this stage we believe he's in the Dallas area because the robberies are occurring in the Dallas area. Move it! Let's go! What you got? Anything? Nothing. 
It was embarrassing. I mean, we were spending all sorts of resources to catch him, and we couldn't. Then things happened rather quickly. The police in Memphis recovered the car carjacked from the uh, elderly man. Hope's prints were in the car, and a newspaper with apartments for rent circled. In the meantime, electronic surveillance had picked up uh, two phone calls made from Memphis to a known female associate of Hope's. We immediately headed to Memphis. There's no perfect fugitive. They're going to make a mistake. You just got to make sure that you're there to catch it. Give me all your money now. Let's go, move. The phone calls led us to a meatpacking store. Who are you, gentlemen? The manager told us that that phone number uh, belonged to uh, his secretary. She's up there. You Don't see? keep her long. She's got work to do. All right. This is Officer Fawcett. I'm Officer Moriarty. Hi, I'm Lucy. She told us that her sister was dating a man named Dennis from Texas. Is my sister OK? We then got the secretary to page Dennis Wayne Hope. All right, we wait. He returned the call. Hello? Hi, Dennis. He told her that he was at the Denim and Diamonds uh, nightclub. OK, I'll see you then. He also said that he was driving a Jaguar and had a white cowboy hat on, blue jeans, boots, and a Western shirt. I didn't try too hard to conceal myself or not to be caught. I didn't want to look like a hermit. To me, that would be meaningless. We immediately drove to Denim and Diamonds and started looking for the Jaguar. We found it parked uh, in the back of the parking lot. This is Fawcett. We need backup at the Denim and Diamonds. And as soon as we went in, I immediately saw him. Our biggest fear is that he's armed, and then we'd have a gun fight in our hands in a crowded bar. And we decided we could get up right on top of him and just grab him. Then I thought I spotted somebody looking at me. I didn't see any officer immediately. I thought, OK, just calm down. Don't get paranoid. We just uh, kind of worked our way like we were listening to the music and, and finally got over to him. I looked at Lou and nodded and we just took him. Get off me! Get off me! Get off me! Son of a bitch. We have to make it. Yeah, we know who you are. Get the head off me! I'm thinking all that work and you just screwed it off being careless. He was in total shock. He could not believe that two cops from Texas were in Memphis to get him. Get your hands off me! Get off me! Get off me! Get off me! It's a sense of despair. Life as you knew it. From that point on, it, it's over with. It was about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, and my phone rings. Hello? Dennis Wayne Hope. You got Hope? I can't describe to you that feeling. Ah! 
Yes! In prison parlance, my count was clear. That time is just passing me by, you know. Uh, it's like trying to put uh, uh, raindrops back into a cloud. It's not going to happen. You're just, you know, waiting until the day that your heart stops beating. And to me, that's not life. <laughs> 